Now, most of our attempts have been in the world of possibility. Most have been close quarter attempts or small arm attempts. What I mean by that is a single person with a firearm, usually handgun, approaching, then firing. With this video, we do, however, have something very different. Today we will be covering the attempt on the life of President Richard Nixon. Now, Nixon today is looked on as a pariah for his infamous Watergate scandal that was first discovered in 1972. But before that, he had been vice president under Dwight D. Eisenhower, the hero of World War II. Nixon ran to succeed Eisenhower would, be, would lose to Kennedy in the election of 1960. But in 1968, he would defeat Her Hubert Humphrey, Lyndon B. Johnson's vice president, in a landslide election. He would be president during the end of the United States' involvement in the Vietnam War. That would not end officially until 1975, when the su southern Vietnam capital of Saigon fell. But Nixon would also be instrumental in bringing China into the world economic community, as well as his hard-on-crime stance, but also he pushed large for integration of schools in the country's history, attempting to bring an end to Jim Crow policies that had survived the Johnson administration. Now, our assassin's today's name you have probably never heard before, and that name is Samuel Sam Bick, a man born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on January 1930. Bick had, been very had a very turbulent life. His parents were poor, so Sam had to drop out of school in order to help his parents stay financially stable. He would then, when he was of age, join the United States Army, in which he would be honorably discharged in 1956. He would then be married, and he and his wife would have four children. Now, if anyone who's been following has noticed in this series, I have not given the name of any spouses, children, or family members. I will continue for their privacy and spare them trauma of those events. So back on to Sam Bick. He and his wife would get a divorce, and he would lose his spouse and children. This would throw him into a Great Depression, so great that he would actually submit himself to a mental institution for treatment for two months. And this was only because of his divorce, but also because multiple businesses he had tried to start or jobs he worked either failed or he was fired. So Bick had a lot of hatred going, growing in his life, self-hate and for others, but one thing calmed him, and it was music. So he began to record himself and send, the, send out the recordings to famous artists. The greatest of note is composer Leonard Bernstein. It's at this time the infamous Watergate scandal would also begin. Now, Bick, as I said, was from a middle-class, working-class family. So already he wasn't a Republican. He was a Democrat. But also, he had been recently denied a loan from the Small Business Administration. So with his political leanings, the denied loan, and the Watergate, and Watergate, Bick became extremely opposed and, so far, hated Richard Nixon, following the trend of our other assassins blaming his mistakes on the president. He would be watched by the president, uh, and this, uh, well, not the president, but by the Secret Service for a period after he made his first threat to the president. Then They then discovered he had tried to join the Black Panthers, the far-left Black Power organization. They would, of course, deny him membership, being not only was he not black, but, they based, but based on his physical condition, they did not find him useful to their cause. It was after this that the Secret Service decided he was not a legitimate threat to the president, but meanwhile in the government, things were not getting any better. As Watergate thundered on in late 1973, Nixon's vice president, Spiro Agnew, resigned. Now, optic optically, this did not help Nixon's case on trying to play dumb in the scandal. It would be like you and your friend do something like steal your brother's baseball glove. Then when getting questioned about it, your friend runs. It's not an ad admission to guilt, but clearly something had happened. Bick, though, this whole time had been watching the president carefully. Now, whereas our other presidents, the 70s, the public wasn't as privy as they had been before about the president's movements. However, Bick was able to recognize the trend of the president's movements. 
through his own stalking style, he decided he had to purify the American government. This meant the total destruction of the executive office in his eyes. So he first stole a twenty-two caliber revolver from his friend. He knew he would be unable to purchase a weapon because he had made open threats against the president. So instead, he stole one. His plan was to get through security, seize a plane, and crash into the White House where Nixon would be. So early in February 22nd, 1974, Bick arrived at the Baltimore-Washington International Airport. He had bought a ticket for a Delta flight, and his bag were explosives, and in his pocket, the twenty two revolver. Now, back then, it wasn't the way it is today in airports. Today, we have layers of security that nothing will get through. You can't even have a water. But back then, you maybe had a single security officer, and everyone just boarded the plane. At 7 o'clock a.m., Samuel Bick noticed one of the security officers at the gate of the plane boarding the bridge. At this point, he decided he was going to commit fully to his insanity. While still in the airport, he pulled his revolver, shooting the security officer, and then stormed onto the plane, sealing the door behind him. The two pilots tried to calm the situation, but Bick, who was completely unhinged, decided to not wait for their responses, shooting both of them. He then grabbed a woman from the passengers and ordered her to fly the plane. After a short standoff, Bick was shot twice from a police officer, who had shot through the peep window of the plane's door. Bick would collapse, dragging himself into cover from the doors. The horrified passengers would then watch as Bick turned the twenty two revolver on himself, shoot himself in the head. One of the pilots would survive, the other would unfortunately die. Bick would be dead on the scene, though he did not, vir he did not virtually get close to his target at the time. People asked why. But the answer would come when it was discovered that Bick had sent an audio tape to columnist Jack Anderson, who revealed what became known as Operation Pandora's Box. In this recording, Bick admitted to his plan. He would hijack the plane and then direct it towards the White House, where the president would still be and crash it into the building, killing all inside. Now Nixon, of course, was shocked and horrified about the violent act, not even on himself, but on the airplane staff. However, he did not have time to be worry, to worry, because six months later, Richard Nixon would become the first president of the United States to resign his office, allowing his new vice president, Gerald Ford, to step in. Big is what, what would begin the slow move towards more serious airport security measures. Our modern security would not be what it is until post-September 11, 2001, but Bick's attempt actually made its way into the 9-11 report that led to the upgrades to security measures in the airports. Thanks for viewing. Tomorrow we will be discussing the two women who attempted to go after Nixon's successor only 17 days apart. Thanks again for joining us. If you enjoyed the content, please like, share, and comment. Also, I saw my analytics, and most, most of our viewers are not subscribers. So please, if you are a new friend, I invite you to hit that little red subscribe button. I do have new videos up daily. So again, thanks again for viewing, and we'll see you in the next one.